I'm, I'm not really used to public speaking, um, but uh, it's great to be here uh, with uh, John McKenzie, CEO of Synovus. Uh, John uh, is somebody who brings a unique pan-Canadian understanding of energy and energy transition is somebody who has been uh, a leader in great Canadian companies like uh, not just Synovus uh, but also Suncor and uh, from Atlanta, Canada, Irving Oil. And uh, in fact, he really is an honorary maritimer. He just bought a beautiful piece of land in St. John, New Brunswick, which shows great vision and foresight to buy a part of the best part of the country in Atlanta, Canada for your future. John, welcome. And I'm looking forward to uh, hearing some of your thoughts on one of the most important questions facing Canada, both economically uh, and socially, I believe, and that is the area of energy transition. It strikes a lot of us that there is a bit of a disconnect between some of the political rhetoric on both sides and a bit of a polarization around some of this and the reality of energy transition, particularly the role of hydrocarbons and cleaner hydrocarbons. And for us to really play our maximum role as a country, in fighting climate change. Could Canadian hydrocarbons, natural gas as an example, play a more significant role in helping the world tackle this extraordinarily important challenge? Yeah, Scott, and, and thank you very much for that kind introduction. Anytime uh, I get awarded an honorary maritime citizenship, I'll, I'll take that any day. It's a very special part of the country uh, for me. And at some point in my future, I, I expect to spend uh, more time there. You know, the, the question you raise um, you know, is a really good one. And it's something we think a lot about at Synovus. And think more broadly, you know, as an industry about as well. I, I came into this industry in 1992. And at that time, global demand for oil was about, I think it was about 75 million barrels a day. And the energy mix, um, and the primary uh, energy mix was about 85% hydrocarbon, meaning coal, natural gas, and oil. Um, fast forward 32 years later, um, hydrocarbon share of primary um, energy generation is still in that 80 to 85 percent range. The mix is different and we've seen a decrease in the market share of oil and we've seen a decrease in the market share of coal and a big increase in the market share of natural gas. But long story short, we've used more and more of all the commodities. So today we consume about 104 um, million barrels a day of oil and we consume considerably more gas and considerably more coal. Now for that, um, we have brought billions of people out of poverty and the world has changed measurably in the next or in the last 30 years. So as, as I think, um, forward to you know the coming decades and where we're going in the 2030s and 40s uh, and 50s and beyond, I don't think there is a reasonable case to believe that that energy mix or market share is going to change uh, materially. We have spent trillions of dollars on renewable energy and good for us. We needed to do that. Renewable energy needs to be a bigger part of the mix going forward. Um, but the reality is that the demand for energy just continues to grow as the world continues to develop. And as we look out, you know, over the next 30 years, uh, you know, I think demographics would say that um, the global energy demand is going to continue to grow and hydrocarbons are going to be, you know, a significant portion um, of that, um, that mix. Now, the point you raise is interesting. Um, in that what does that hydrocarbon mix look like and, and how can we as Canada um, 
provide um, part of that energy solution uh, and at the same time do it in a, a cleaner or more uh, sustainable, um, more ethical way. And I would argue that Canada has some of the highest um, uh, regulatory standards in all the energy we produce, including hydrocarbons. We are the only country in the top 10 oil producing in the world, uh, top 10 uh, oil producers in the world, top 10 gas producers in the world that has a carbon tax. We are the only country uh, that has the higher um, level of social and um, uh, government regulation, uh, I think almost bar none. So that, that should be a point that we keep in mind. We also have a huge endowment of natural gas in Canada. The Montney region in northern Alberta is one of the world's most prolific and largest um, natural gas fields that we have in North America and, and even more broadly uh, globally. And we're on the precipice of bringing forward our first LNG project in Canada. So we've managed to build one LNG project off the west coast of Canada. In that time, the U.S. has built 14 and they're going... Uh, forward with, with several more in the coming years. But the significance of that is that LNG goes to countries where they burn coal uh, to produce electricity and displaces uh, some of those fuels and the carbon that goes with it. So there, I think there's a real opportunity for us in Canada uh, to meet the energy needs of the, of the world in a more environmentally friendly and a more sustainable, sustainable and ethical way uh, than if we don't uh, participate in the energy future. How important is Canadian energy and cleaner hydrocarbons like uh, natural gas uh, geopolitically today, and how has that changed in recent years? What is the geopolitical imperative uh, for Canada to step up? Well, it's, it's often not known, but um, hydrocarbons is something, and energy more broadly, is something that Canada does very well. Whether it's hydropower in Quebec and, and Vancouver, or, or sorry, BC, or whether it's nuclear energy in Ontario or hydrocarbons in the Prairie Provinces, we are, as I mentioned, uh, punch well above our weight in terms of um, our population size relative to our comp uh, our uh, contribution to global energy. We are uh, the fourth or fifth uh, largest um, oil producer. We typically swap places with China or Iraq for fourth and fifth. I think today we are uh, officially ranked fourth only behind the US, Saudi Arabia, uh, and Russia. But a, a very desirable place for, for us to be uh, positioned globally. Similarly on natural gas, uh, I think we're the fifth largest producer of uh, natural gas globally, and that's in a market that's growing at seven to eight BCF a day. So as we see, um, you know, geopolitical events uh, take place, I think it's really important that we frame the policy that we have in Canada, not just around economics and not just around uh, environmental concerns, but also around energy security. And the way I define energy security is our ability as a society to produce cheap energy, uh, to produce reliable energy, and to produce abundant energy that meets the needs of society. It's only when you do those three things um, that you create energy security. And what we've seen uh, over the past number of years is energy security be uh, become a much bigger issue um, internationally than it is here in Canada. And it's, it's kind of interesting to me, I'll give you um, a little bit of an anecdote, but when uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine, uh, the call went out to North American hydrocarbon producers, how quickly can you bring on more supply? So this came from our, our governments, how quickly can you bring on more supply? And, and the answer is in the short term, um, we can't bring on much. I think the answer from uh, the Canadian producers is about 200,000 barrels a day, which is a drop in the bucket when we think about uh, the natural gas supply from Russia to uh, the EU being cut off. And so when we, when we kind of evaluate energy security uh, in terms of our policy, I think it's incredibly important uh, that we do have, have a framework that ensures that the world has um, access to that cheap, reliable, um, 
um, and abundant energy sources that, that allow people to do what they need to do on a daily basis. It's something I think we take for, for granted here in Canada because we have so much of it, but it's becoming a, a really increasing issue for the rest of the world. You've been a, a partner in the Pathways uh, Initiative, which uh, is a, quite a unique partnership between uh, uh, industry, uh, government, and, and stakeholders in achieving energy transition. Um, could you just, for those in the audience who are not familiar with Pathways, uh, give a brief overview on what it's doing and why it's important uh, for, regardless of which government uh, is in Ottawa uh, or Edmonton, perhaps, um, why is Pathways important to the future of Canada's leadership in energy transition? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I would say Pathways is something that is very unique and bespoke to Canada. Uh, I mentioned we are the fourth largest energy producer, oil producer globally. But as a industry, um, we emit about 25 to 28% of Canada's uh, GHG emissions. And the reason um, that we are such a disproportionately large share of Canada's emissions is that most of the product that we produce is for export. It's not for uh, domestic consumption. Most of it finds its way down into the U.S., and now that we've started up the TMX pipeline, we have access to international markets. And with the startup of LNG Canada, uh, our natural gas is going to have access to um, international markets as well. But one of the things that I think is really important is, is we are the only uh, major oil producing nation globally that is taking such a progressive uh, stance towards decarbonizing the industry. Pathways was um, started in, I think it was 2022, so it's just over two years old. And it's a um, joint venture uh, between the six largest oil sands producers. And, and together between the six of us, we produce about 95% uh, of Canada's oil sands, roughly two, two and a half million barrels a day. So we're, we're big companies by any stretch. And we recognize that if we are to make significant inroads on decarbonization of our industry, uh, we need to be part of that solution. If Canada is going to meet its Paris climate uh, goals or decarbonize in any kind of reasonable time frame, you know, the oil industry needs to be uh, a significant part of that simply because of the magnitude of our emissions vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the um, economy. Uh, so we, we got together as a group and we looked at uh, a number of technologies that were available to us that would um, allow us to commercialize uh, decarbonization products or projects in a short period of time. And the view at that time is really the only technology uh, that is material and commercial and would allow us to decarbonize in the time frames that are being put forward by our federal government is, is carbon capture and sequestration. Now, the interesting thing for us is that uh, this technology is very applicable uh, to how we produce our oil in the oil sands in that we have a number of, of plants in a very tight geography that emit uh, concentrated streams of CO2 and the subsurface or the geology uh, in and around that area is very conducive uh, to sequestration of the carbon. So it's a unique opportunity uh, for Canada and it, it's, uh, it conf or configures itself well um, to the type of industry we are. So over the past, um, or the better part of two years, uh, the industry group has been negotiating with the provincial and the federal government to come up with a framework uh, that allows industry to move forward with these mega projects over multiple years uh, to decarbonize in a way that doesn't make our industry uh, non-competitive, because I mentioned we are the only country doing this. They're not doing similar things in the U.S. And in fact, in the U.S., they actually uh, incent companies uh, to do carbon capture by paying them uh, for each time they sequester. So we need to remain competitive, but at the same time, um, we know we need to do our part. We need to pay uh, 
our fair share, if you will. I know that's a popular phrase in today's world. But we need help from the um, provincial and federal governments. These projects have no revenue associated with them. Uh, they are not done for economic reasons. They are done for environmental and sustainable uh, reasons. And for that reason, we really need a public-private partnership where the federal government, the province, uh, and the industry all comes together. So I, I'm very optimistic that this will happen. I have never in my career uh, seen an industry group as committed as the Pathways Group is to try to make this happen. I think the real sticking point uh, for the tripart arrangements really revolves around who's going to pay for what, how do we streamline the regulatory process, and how do we ensure that we keep the industry um, competitive going forward. You have been balanced and even supportive of carbon pricing and uh, you worked uh, Suncor, and I remember back in 2008 uh, having this conversation with Rick George, who was actually extremely uh, supportive and open to carbon pricing. How important is, uh, whether it's carbon tax or, or cap and trade, how, how important is carbon pricing to getting this right? And uh, do you think cap and trade or 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 carbon taxes ultimately will create the best result as public policy? You know, I think one of the, the interesting things, Scott, that that's probably isn't well understood is even, even in the absence of carbon pricing, our industry is already incented to reduce our emissions. And what I mean by that is if, if you look at the emissions profile of companies like my, like ours or like uh, Canadian Natural Resources, Suncor and the like, um, the emissions profile really comes from our consumption and combustion of natural gas. And natural gas is our one of our biggest cost inputs into what we do. What we do is we combust natural gas to produce uh, steam and heat, which we then put under the ground to melt oil, and we bring that to the surface. And we are very, very um, diligent and very, very cognizant of exactly how much natural gas we're burning at any time. If, if you're familiar with the company, um, you'll know that uh, we talk about steam oil ratios uh, an awful lot. And that's the amount of steam that we need to generate one barrel of oil. It's a measure of efficiency. It's a measure uh, of how well you're using the, your gas. And the lower your steam oil ratio, the lower your carbon intensity. The issue that we have is we don't really have a substitute uh, for the natural gas that works in, in the kind of commercial scale that we need to to produce the oil. It's very much like agriculture where it's a, it's a very carbon intensive business because they use so much ammonia based fertilizer. The reality is that's a huge cost for the agricultural business so they use it very judiciously already and they're, and they're clearly incented to reduce their um, usage of it. The problem is there's no substitute. So when it comes to carbon taxing when we put that on top or, or uh, cap and trade I think we've been um, really clear that a carbon tax can be effective in, um, in, in inducing the type of behavior that we want, but there have to be some conditions applied to it. It has to be universally applied. It can't pick and choose winner. It has to be ubiquitous. There have to be um, ready-made alternatives, uh, technologically um, acceptable alternatives for what we're trying to uh, replace. If, if there are none, um, then it, it just becomes a cost for the business. In our business, we can't, we can't pass that along to the consumer. That has to be absorbed by us because we uh, produce into a global market and uh, our commodities receive a global price. And then the third thing is, um, because we're doing this as a country by ourselves, it can't, um, it can't make our exports uncompetitive. And as I mentioned, most of what we produce uh, in oil and gas goes to the U.S. where they have no carbon tax. So assuming that, that you can get past those um, you know, preconditions, I think a carbon tax can be um, impactful and it can be effective in getting the kind of behavior that we want. But it has to be uh, very nuanced in terms of... Um, um, trying to drive the, those those kind of right behaviors. 
In terms of cap and trade carbon tax, you know, I think we've been pretty clear that the carbon tax is, is our favorite mechanism. More predictable and harder to game in a sense and be transparent about, I guess. So the, uh, now, you mentioned agriculture and uh, uh, energy transition and agriculture seem to be uh, really aligned in many ways if we get this right. Where do you see um, opportunities in uh, modernizing and rendering more efficient agriculture with energy transition and also other traditional industries and biofuels and pulp and paper as an example and 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 to what extent should we be really focused on all sectors all industrial sectors as a partner in progress in energy transition yeah i i think there's some sectors that are going to be much easier to reduce the carbon footprint on than others when we talk about things like um, agri or sorry, uh, pulp and paper. You know, I, I think they're easier industries to electrify um, than others. I think the key building blocks to society um, that are going to be increasingly difficult to decarbonize would include things like agriculture, our steel industry, uh, the making of cement, and plastics. You know, the fundamental building blocks uh, for those. Uh, you know, four pillars of, of our society really are predicated on um, hydrocarbons. There is no alternative to ammonium-based fertilizer other than to burn natural gas. There is no alternative uh, to making plastics than petrochemicals. So I think those things uh, will be increasingly difficult, but I, I also believe we have real opportunity uh, to continue to electrify those those um, industries that are more conducive uh, to using electric power versus hydrocarbon generated power. How important is nuclear? You mentioned nuclear and SMR technology. To what extent is Canada positioned to lead? Yeah, so, um, you know, in many respects, Canada has been um, a leader in nuclear for a lot of decades. And then I think post uh, Fukushima, we all kind of forgot it was there and it was it was dormant for years. You know, I mentioned in, in Pathways, um, we looked at all technologies and we landed on carbon capture and sequestration as probably being the most easily commercial uh, technology that's available um, that can meet our decarbonization needs in the time frame um, that we've set for ourselves, that we've set for ourselves as a country. Uh, but that's a post-combustion um, technology. It's trying to capture the CO2 molecule after you've already um, combusted the natural gas or whatever hydrocarbon you're using which I think makes it, you know, a bit more clunky, a bit more um, or less efficient uh, than what you're talking about. So nuclear energy uh, for us uh, would be something that I think in an ideal world uh, would be an implementable, implementable solution. Now, the issue that you have with nuclear power is, is one, the cost of installation, and we need to do something like that. We've got a regulatory process that will take uh, a number of years before we were uh, we would ever be able to um, build scale nuclear facilities that would allow us to, um, you know, generate steam and power from nuclear. And then there's always, you know, the NIMBY problem too, and that nobody wants a, a nuclear power station in there, their backyard. There's the NIMBY problem, and then there's also the banana problem. That is build absolutely nothing anywhere, uh, which has become a, a bit of a problem in our country too. Um, one last question. I can't let you get off the stage before telling us about uh, the indigenous partnerships that uh, Sonovus and industry have led in terms of indigenous uh, reconciliation and economic empowerment. Yeah, I don't thank you for that. And um, I don't think this is well known as well, but the, the energy industry is the biggest employer of Aboriginal Canadians and the salaries that we pay um, are significantly more um, than what the average um, um, Aboriginal salary is. We uh, employ more than 10,000 First Nations people in our industry today. 
And we also um, spend a significant uh, amount of money with uh, First Nations businesses. When I uh, think about the amount of money that Synovus has um, um, paid to Aboriginal businesses since 2009, I think it's about $1.6 billion. And we are no, by, by no stretch the largest uh, company um, that contributes and, and works with Abor Aboriginal businesses, Suncor and uh, Canadian Natural Resources, Conoco and the like also do the same thing. So we believe as a company, I think we believe as an industry, uh, that it is incredibly important to invest in the communities where we do business. And we do a lot of business in the northern part of rural Alberta, northern BC, and northern Saskatchewan has been a real priority uh, of our company and our industry uh, to ensure that we are reinvesting in those communities. We hire people, we invest in the businesses, as I talked about. But I think the other thing that we do um, that I think I, I'm really most proud of, and I can't take credit for this because my predecessor started it, uh, was we started a program in 2021 uh, to build 200 homes on First Nations um, land to directly uh, try to bend the curve on the housing crisis that we see on First Nations reserves. And to date, uh, we've built, I think, 110. We've got 90 more to go. My suspicion is once we finish this, we are going to um, do this again, and maybe at a bigger scale, uh, we'll have to see. But I have seen nothing that our company does that raises the morale of people more uh, than the pride we feel when we see these homes show up uh, on First Nations land and people move into them and people that didn't have homes, clean water and the like, enjoying a, a different standard of living all at once. I can't think of a better way to close this discussion than just the way you just did, reminding us of uh, not just the E in ESG, but the S and the importance to communities and uh, the Indigenous uh, communities and the opportunities that energy represents to them is a really important investment in the future of Canada. Thank you very much, John McKenzie. And can we hear a warm round of applause for John McKenzie? Thank you.